<laughs> All right, while they're getting the stage ready, after 17 years of marriage, a man dumped his wife for his young secretary. His new girlfriend demanded that she wanted to live in the couple's multi-million dollar home, and since the man's lawyers were a little better, he prevailed. He gave his now ex-wife just three days to move out. She spent the first day packing her belongings into boxes, crates, and suitcases. On the second day, she had the movers come and collect her things. On the third day, she sat down for the last time in their beautiful dining room, table by candlelight, put on some soft background music, and feasted on a pound of shrimp, a jar of caviar, and a bottle of Chardonnay. When she had finished, she went into each and every room and deposited a few half-eaten shrimp shells dipped in caviar into the hollow of the curtain rods. She then cleaned up the kitchen and left. When the husband returned with his new girlfriend, all was bliss for the first few days. Then slowly the house began to smell. They tried everything, cleaning and mopping and airing the place out. Vents were checked for dead rodents and carpets were steam cleaned. Air fresheners were hung everywhere. Exterminators were brought in to set off gas canisters during which they had to move out for a few days. And in the end, they even paid to replace the expensive wool carpeting. Nothing worked. People stopped coming over to visit. Repairmen refused to work in the house. The maid quit. Finally, they could not take the stench any longer and decided to move. A month later, even though they had cut their price in half, they couldn't find a buyer for their stinky house. Word got out and eventually even the local realtors refused to return their calls. Finally, they had to borrow a huge sum of money from the bank to purchase a new place. The ex-wife called the man and asked how things were going. He told her the saga of the rotting house. She listened politely, and then she said she missed her old house terribly and would be willing to reduce her divorce settlement in exchange for getting the house back. Knowing his ex-wife had no idea how bad the smell was, he agreed on the price that was about one-tenth of what the house had been worth, but only if she were to sign the papers that very day. She agreed, and within hours, his lawyers delivered the paperwork. A week later, the man and his new girlfriend stood smirking as they watched the moving company pack everything to take to their new house including the curtain rods. Everybody stand. Let's bring this back to order. Amen. Repeat after me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For your work on the cross. For your work on the cross. All my sins are forgiven. All my sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for your work in the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for your work in the resurrection. Because you live, I too shall live. Because you live, I too shall live. Thank you, Lord, for energy. Thank you, Lord, for energy. Empowered by your Holy Spirit. Empowered by your Holy Spirit. I can do all things. I can do all things. Through Christ. Through Christ. Who strengthens me. Who strengthens me. Thank you, Lord, for your Lordship. Thank you, Lord, for your Lordship. I belong to you. I belong to you. Nothing comes to me. Nothing comes to me. That doesn't first pass through you. That doesn't first pass through you. And thank you, Lord, for your love. And thank you, Lord, for your love. Nothing can separate me from your love. Nothing Allow me to pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the unity we have here in the Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the living body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us and chose us for these, this time. We pray now that your holy word would just speak to us, O oh God. Holy Spirit, anoint your word. Make it alive in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a seat. Amen. All right. I better get rid of the... Dangerous. Your boss. All right, we were assigned uh, four through seven, but we're just starting the Book of Kings. And of course, you know, someone once said that under David, Israel had a golden age. And it kind of spilled over in the time of Solomon, but under Solomon, it started to tarnish a little bit. And after he dies, the kingdom 
turns to rust. And uh, we were with David last, and now it's Solomon's turn. Remember, Solomon is the son of Bathsheba and David, and he was the chosen one for the crown. There was a little battle getting him there, but he's there. So in order for us to set the stage where we're supposed to go tonight, I'd like to have you open up your Bibles to 1 Kings 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. Let's see what it says about our Solomon. You know, while you're turning there, many people, listen to this, many people when they think of Solomon, they think of the terrible end of his life. His many wives and falling into idolatry. and That's all they can think about. And they think that his whole life was a big giant shipwreck. But in reality, he began a whole different way. And that's the Solomon we're going to take a look at tonight. In 1 Kings 3.3 3 it says, And Solomon loved the Lord. And Solomon loved the Lord. How did he show his love to the Lord? By walking in the statutes of his father, David. David, before he died, he talked to his son, Now, son, be a man. Above anything else, everything else, I want you to be obedient to God's word. I want you to obey his statutes. And if you do those things, you're going to have a successful reign and the kingdom will continue forever. And Solomon heard those words, and here it says he did. However, there's a little word after that. It says, except. How do you know there's an exception to his walking in the statutes of his father David? It says, except that he sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places. So what's that got to do with it? Well, the high places were all these different high places where the pagans offered their sacrifices to their gods. And many times their rituals included a lot of sexual perversion, etc., etc. And the gods' people were using those same places, pushing aside those idols, and worshiping and, said, and performing sacrifices to the God Almighty. Well, how many know that that is not a good place to be offering sacrifices? However, the verse before that says they didn't have a central place. The temple hadn't been built. So it's kind of like, yeah, but it's not a good thing. It's kind of like a little compromise. It's kind of like when you're at the top of the hill and you want to go down and you feel the rocks are, they're starting to, go, you, you know, there's a little erosion going and there's a few, few rocks that are starting to tumble and you're studying your feet. And I look at this and say, you know, there's a little thing happening here. Compromised a little, but it wasn't that major of a thing. So let's continue and see what happens. It says now in verse 5 that the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. You know, it's interesting. I noticed that with Solomon, when he was younger, notice the prophets didn't go and tell him what God wanted. God himself visited him in dreams or just through communicating to him. It doesn't mention prophets. He was very close to the Lord. And so God came to him and he said, you have shown, and he said, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And he says, what shall I give you? Wow, a blank check. What do you want? Okay, what do you want? And Solomon answers, you have shown great mercy to your servant David. Now he's thanking him. He's giving a praise offering to him for what you've done for my father. And he's walked in the truth and righteousness and upright of heart. And you've continued this great kindness, this great kindness for him. And you have given him a son. You've allowed me to sit on the throne. And here it comes. Lord God, you have made your servant king. Instead of my father David, but I'm a little child, I don't know how to go in and out. I don't know how to live my life. The guy, he was a kid, 20 years old. And I always tease and I make comments, but it's true. You, when you're 20 years old, that old frontal lobe hasn't been developed. Amen. <laughs> and you're not going to be acting reasonably. Amen. You're going to, uh, 20, especially a male, oh my goodness, you're not going to act 
rationally, you're going to kick into your emotions. Okay? He's very honest. He says, "Look, I've got this. I got big shoes to fill. I got big shoes to fill. You know, my dad, my dad, David. Look what he did. You know, he's military victories all around. Now we're together. We're secure, and I got this big kingdom. And I'm only 20. I don't know what to do. I want wisdom. I need to know how to do this. And God respects and admires his humility. This is Solomon, humble before him." And what does God do? He says, I'm not even going to give you wisdom. Wisdom par excellence above anybody else. But he also said, besides that, look at verse 13. I'm also going to give what you have not asked, riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. All your days. Riches, wisdom, honor. I couldn't help but think of Matthew 6.33. What does it say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Solomon sought first. First. And so God said, you know what? It's all is going to be yours. I also thought of... Um, I didn't think of it. I saw it in a note. 1 Timothy 4.8 says, For bodily exercise profits a little. Remind JC that. <laughs> but here it comes. Here it comes. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of what is to come. In other words, those who seek to obey, to trust and obey, to seek first his righteousness, you know what? You got going to have it made here, and you're really going to have it made on the other side. And so what we see here in the Old Testament is yes and amen for us in the New Testament also. But then he says, so he's going to bless him with all this, but then he has a little conditional thing in 14. If you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Then I will lengthen your days. And so what does he do? It says he woke from the dream. He went to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and he offered a public burnt offerings and so forth. Here is a man that's got this intimate personal relationship with the Lord. And is not afraid to go in front of the entire group, the congregation, offer up his personal thanksgiving for who God is. Can you hear what God has done for you? That's what we want to see. You have a testimony, what God has done for you. And you're bold to declare it because of your love for the Lord. That's our Solomon. I'm going to hear it my mouth. Do I even have a cat? <laughs> and then there's the story there to show the wisdom that, that Solomon had how many know the story two prostitutes and there's one baby and a lady comes in and she says you know what that woman over there took my baby because in the night we, they slept with their babies they didn't have cribs and in the night I'll tell you what happened. She rolled over and her baby died and she swapped her dead baby for my baby and, and she has my baby. And Solomon says, and they're bar arguing back and forth. No, this is my baby. No, it's your. And so finally, you know, the wisdom of Solomon says, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Give me a sword. We'll cut that baby right in half and give half to you and half to you. And how many know that the one mother said, oh, please, King, give it to her. I don't want anything to happen to that baby. And the other one says, no, I think we should cut it in half. We'll share it. Solomon says, she's the mother. Give it to her. Wisdom. Wisdom. And so I said that because look at verse 28. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, 
And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Man, this place was wonderful. Secure borders all around. A king who has wisdom from God. They have a sense of peace. They have a sense of togetherness. They're not battering back and forth and wondering what's going to happen. This is truly the golden age. Amen. I'm sure some wondered, is this the kingdom of God that's going to restore the mess in Genesis? Because it seems so like it. You skip over now to chapter 4. I don't want to skip over some of the good stuff that I wrote down. Chapter 4. Now we're going to see the administrative wisdom of him. He was so smart. You have to remember that... Prior to David, they had the judges. And they had all these different tribes every which way, and they were battering, and they had problems. But now they're all together. And Solomon is wise. He takes the entire area and divides them up into 12 parts. He didn't go according to tribes. He just divided them up. And 12 parts. Governors, 12 sections, 12 months out of the year. Each one would provide for him and his household, including feeding his 40,000 horses, and kept all this up. Once, once, one, once a month, once a month would one group do it, and they would rotate. Once and a Once a year. Yeah, once a year. And that's how they were able to rotate, and they were able to keep that up. And Solomon was very, very sharp in what he was doing. Look at verse 20 in chapter 4, verse 20. Judah and Israel were as numerous. Now they're talking about the two major parts of this entire area. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and rejoice, drinking and rejoicing. When God spoke to Abraham, listen carefully, remember what he said. He said, Abraham, you believed me, you trusted me. I'm not only going to give you that land, but guess what? You are going to have so many descendants that there are going to be as many as the stars in the sky and what? As the grains of sand on the seashore. So you're looking at this and you're thinking, wow. Abraham's promise is coming through. And then verse 21, it describes the entire area that Solomon now can say is theirs. And the boundary lines, listen carefully, in the kingdom at that time were the exact boundary lines that God had told Abraham that that would be their land. So you see how all these things are coming together. And so I'm sure there was great anticipation, there was great hope, there was security. They respected the king, they obeyed the king, and they followed through, and everything was good. And let's take a look at some of the other things it says about him. Look at verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart, just like the sand and the seashore. The Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And then they list a bunch of Einsteins of that time. And it says, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Look at 32. Look what he did. He spoke 30,000 proverbs. 3,000. And his songs were 1,005. He was a poet and he was a songwriter. Look what else he did. He spoke of trees from the cedar trees of Lebanon even to the hyssop and, and that spring out of the walls. He was into botany. He knew all about botany. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things and of fish. He was into zoology. He studied animals. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. You know, 
He was kind of a renaissance man. And I don't know about you, but I don't like mediocrity. You know, didn't Paul say, whatever you're going to hand finds to do it, do it with all your heart? Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if we really, everything we're interested in, we delved into it? Do you realize when you start studying the different varieties of plants and things and realizing the leaves that are different or you study the stars and you're overwhelmed by the galaxies or you're studying the human body and you go in and you understand all the intricacies of everything. When you go 110%, my friends, you're going to discover how beautiful and wonderful God is and you are going to honor and glorify God even more. And when you honor and glorify God more, you love Him more. And when you love Him more, you're going to obey Him. You're going to walk in His righteousness. You're going to be blessed. And that's what it's all about. Amen. So whatever it is, whether it's doing your homework, whether it's memorizing a verse, give it all you've got. Don't be mediocre. Amen. Mediocre. Some of you people are playing the card, well, I destroyed all my brain cells, poo, as Walt would say in the Greek. They're finding out now that there's, you, can, you can create new patterns. You can do more. I challenge you. I challenge you. So I had to throw that in. I really, I really admire, admire him about that, and I think that's awesome. Well, now it's getting to the point now. In Chapter 5, we're going to find out all about his the genius as administrator and an architect. Hang in there, you guys. Here we go. First of all, what he did was David, King David, had a dear friend. His name was Hiram. And Hiram was a man who, um, where was he from? Si um, Sire. Tyre. Up the coast, up the Mediterranean. They raised big trees. They had a lot of trees. And they'd float them down. And David, he was given a bunch of trees, built his house. So Psalm says, hey, you know, uh, my dad, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a house to honor the Lord. So they made a deal. Well, he was willing even to send some of uh, the, the, the Israelites up there to help him with the trees, show them how to do it. And he was willing to pay them and make a deal. They, they made a deal, an agreement, a covenant. And he got the trees that they needed for the structures, and then, and then the, in turn, Solomon made sure that the king, uh, the Hiram, and all of his, his uh, forces were paid in full with food, and that's what they wanted. So he was able to do that. So that was one thing that he did, and uh, when he did that. Okay, look at verse 12 of chapter 5, verse 12. So the Lord gave Solomon wisdom, as he had promised, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty together. And King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel, and the labor force was 30,000 men. And then there's going to be some other people that he's going to raise up. We're going to talk more about that year and days to come, which was kind of another one of those little rocks that started the landslide down. But then I want you to see also, uh, let's take a look at 6. Let's get that house built. In chapter 6 is when he is going to build his temple. This was something that he wanted to do. Chapter 6. Chapter 6. Chapter 6 tells you about the temple. Let me share with you some facts. The temple was twice the size of the tabernacle, not real large. It was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 15 feet high. It took seven years to complete. You see that in verse 37, 38. Craftsmanship were exceedingly elaborate. A porch led into the main sanctuary, and for the house he made windows with artistic frames. The doors weren't simply for opening and closing. They were adorned with intricately carved cherub angels, gourds, palm trees, and open flowers. 
The attention paid to artistic detail was time consuming as was the method of construction. The gold was used to cover the entire temple as a symbol of the value of worship and fellowship with God. Not only did they build it with the cedars of Lebanon, but then they covered everything with gold. Gold all over, and then carved intricately everything. Solomon wanted the very best for God. And it took him seven years to do it. Seven years. This was the temple that he wanted from. And you know, I couldn't help but thank you guys. Think about this now. In the New Testament... We also learn about a temple in 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Think about that. Solomon took such care to make sure that that concrete temple that was going to be the place where God was going to manifest himself, that it was the very best, and now we are the temple, Put two and two together. You are the temple of God individually and then collectively. We are living stones. And so we need to also be of the very best quality because we house the very spirit of the living God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Chapter 7. Thank you for hanging in there. This is the most exciting part, but it's interesting. Chapter 7. Now this is interesting. How many years did it take for him to build the temple? Seven. Look what it says here in chapter 7. But Solomon took how many? Thirteen. And notice it starts off with a but, which which is a continuation of the previous sentence. So he was seven years in building it, the temple, but, how many know it's like a but, it's kind of a contrast, right? But Solomon took what? 13 years to build his house. His house was not a house, it was a compound. 13 years. 13 years that he dipped to build that house. And house itself, my friends, it was the same height as the temple, but considerably longer and more than twice as wide. He had a hall of pillars that came like a, it actually served as a giant entranceway into his house or his palace. But then he had several other buildings that he had constructed on this huge property area. And if you look real carefully, when it came to the materials they used, costly stones, costly stones, costly stones were here, costly stones were there, costly stones were here. He didn't hold back. I mean, it was something else that he built for himself. That he built for himself. Well, chapter 8 talks about the dedication of the temple. I don't understand. When he dedicated the temple, it was, oh God, to you, we just give you this temple, we offer these sacrifices, and you're going to help us to walk in your ways. And la da 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 da. And all the time, my friends, he's like starting to slip on that slope. How many know that once you lose your, your, your footing, you're either going to go down in your hickamashai, or you're going to be running like this with your hands like this? Because that's exactly what happened to Solomon. Because if you take a look, I don't want to, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too much because you're going to be reading this. But in just in chapter nine, verse one, 
And this, this is probably 13 years after the dedication of the temple. Remember, it took 13 years to build his house. And my friends, it didn't just his house and his compound. Listen carefully. He built structures all over the place. He had slave labor working everywhere. He wanted a special place there and a special place there and a special place there. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire which he wanted to do. What do you do when you did it all? What do you do? You got everything you want done. How many know that when you finally accomplish something, warning, warning, warning. Someone said this, sometimes when we have a completed and a demanding and challenging task, we are tempted to relax on commitment, slacken our discipline, and give in to self-indulgence. How many disciples wave their... I did it the first thing I ever completed in my entire life. Go right out that door and celebrate. I did it. We're talking about the same man who was humble and said, God, I need help. And now what do we have? We have a man who has... Well, if he would have read the book that he's supposed to read in Deuteronomy, it said several things about the kings. Number one, you don't have a lot of horses. Horses, why? You know, God's going to be your defense. He had 4,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 for horsemen. Then it also said, he don't accumulate a lot of gold and silver. He was a billionaire over, and he knew it. And then it says this, and he's not to take many wives. And just a couple chapters that follow, in chapter 11, it says, and King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, Women of the Moabites, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Sidon, all the otherites, and they brought all of their gods with them. And it was just a matter of time when Solomon was worshiping them. Amen. He's at the bottom of the hill. And I was just sharing with my brother this afternoon. I'm sorry, I can't see where he is. I'm the last time. Lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, the women. Amen. Lust of the flesh, greed. I want more, I want bigger, I want better, I want this, I want that. I am this, this, and the pride of life. Everybody thought, whoa, this is why Solomon. That's where he ended up. And he started out humble at 20 years old. God, I don't know how to do this. Amen. Just a matter of time. Little things. Yeah. Little things. Amen. Aristotle said, in the brain of the wisest of men always resides the corner of the fool. Amen. And then another thing I want to say this. With God there is forgiveness and abundant mercy. He is long-suffering and slow to wrath. This was evident in both David and Solomon, yet God has boundaries that when crossed, provoke his anger and discipline. Think of Solomon if you are playing or pursuing sin and pushing it to the limit. For how can you tell when you have reached the limit, God will Tolerate. Any of you guys that are chipping away at little things that you know you shouldn't be doing, you're going to find your feet slipping and it'll only be a matter of time and you're going to be down the bottom of the hill. Amen. You better stop now because you don't know. You don't know 
when God finally says, stepping back. God was so gracious that he came to him again and warned him again before he accumulated all of the wives. God saw him. God speaks to you through his word. When you're copying those proverbs, when you're listening to me or anybody else speak, when you're singing songs, he's speaking to you. Amen. Listen to him. Amen. You don't know Amen. when the little things you think you are, well, nobody knows in this. Those are the little things, the erosion that's Amen. going to start you going down that slippery slope. And don't blame the devil. Amen. Okay? This is firm stuff. And I think it applies to all of us, Pastor Walt and myself. We all have to be on guard. Amen. God is good. No, the kingdom didn't come for them. The kingdom didn't come for them. Jesus said what? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He was the king. And we are so fortunate that his kingdom is within us. Yes. And we have a Holy Spirit that's guiding and directing us yes. so that we can be the men and women of God that he wants us to be. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we thank you so much for the life of Solomon, God. Our heart goes out. Lord, you had mercy on him for the sake of his father, David. But oh, what a price he paid. What a price he paid. God, I just pray for every one of us, Pastor Walt and myself included, that we would not lie to ourselves, that we would heed your warnings from your word, that we would encourage one another to love and good works, that, God, we might be strong and humble, men and women of integrity, lovers of you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're dismissed. Sign up.